content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome. You're watching and listening to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on TV and on DAB. This afternoon, we'll be keeping you up to date with the latest on what's going on in Ukraine. And on that note, we'll be talking about whether now is the time to lift the ban on fracking. But first, it's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Good afternoon. It's two o'clock in the GB newsroom. The Ukrainian president says 100,000 Russian soldiers have invaded Ukraine. Volodymyr Zelensky says the country is still controlling Kiev, but urged the UN Security Council for political support. Citizens are being warned to seek shelter as gunfire and explosions have been heard throughout the capital and fighting has broken out on the streets. In a social media post, President Zelensky has reassured Ukrainians that he would not be leaving Kiev, saying the fight is here. Lately, there has been a lot of fake information online that I am calling on our army to lay down arms and to evacuate. Listen, I am here. We will not lay down the weapons. We will defend our state because our weapon is our truth. And the truth is that this is our land, our country, our children. And we will defend all of that. The UN aid agency is warning five million people could spill across the borders into Ukraine's neighbouring countries. Well, our home and security editor Mark White joins us in the studio now. And Mark, we're three days into this invasion. Do we know how many have crossed so far? And is this figure true, do you think? Well, Times, we're getting some initial figures of about 120,000 who have left Ukraine so far. There's some very significant queues on border crossings into the likes of Poland uh, and Romania, uh, Moldova as well. So we are expecting that uh, that number will grow. What you're seeing uh, on the screens just now, and I'll describe it for our radio listeners as well, is British tanks going into Estonia. They arrived yesterday. We are told that a thousand more British troops are on standby. The reason they're on standby is to go to any of the Baltic states that request them to go, either because of security concerns or to deal with this growing humanitarian crisis. Now, the UNHCR is estimating potentially up to 5 million, but it could be more than that. There are more than 40 million people in Ukraine. Those uh, of fighting age men between 16 and 60 are told they have to stay in the country, but clearly women and children and old men are heading towards that border now in very, very significant numbers. Okay, Mark White, our Home and Security Minister, thank you uh, so much for the moment. Thank you. 
Well, Labour MP Stephen Kinnock told GB News that if Russia attacks a NATO member country, that would be an attack on all of NATO. So much as considers putting a, a, a single a military boot on the ground into any of those NATO countries, then the consequences for him will be swift and they will be uh, catastrophic. Uh, and that is what I think we have to make absolutely clear to him now, whilst doing everything we can to arm the resistance in Ukraine uh, so that we stand with our friends and, and partners and allies uh, against this tyrant and gangster that Mr Putin uh, really is. Well, GB News' Anaya Falaran Iman is outside the Russian embassy in London where protests in support of Ukraine are taking place. We've heard people saying Putin out. We've heard uh, stop the war. We've also heard a lot of people actually having placards when it's uh, putting pressure on the international community to actually remove uh, Russia from the swift banking system. That is an international banking system that enables money to move around internationally quite easily. And I think that increasingly people are uh, putting pressure on that to be one of the ways in which uh, diplomatically people go further. And I think speaking to some of the people there, there is just this sense that not enough is being done, that there is violence and bloodshed going on, but actually there does seem to be a kind of resistance from the international community to, to do more. The UK, US, Canada and the European Union have announced plans to impose rare personal sanctions on President Vladimir Putin and his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. At a resolution meeting in New York last night, the United Nations Security Council failed to pass a motion that would call on Moscow to cease fire and withdraw its troops because it was vetoed by Russia. China, India and the United Arab Emirates abstained from the vote. In other news now, British Airways passengers have criticised absolute chaos at Heathrow Airport after a technology outage. Travellers complained of a lack of communication after all short-haul flights were cancelled up until midday today. The issue also caused flight delays and baggage pile-ups. BA has tweeted it's fixed the problem, claiming it was down to a hardware issue and not a cyber attack. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for tuning in on telly and radio with me this afternoon. Here's what's coming up on the show. Average UK fuel prices have hit new highs as the invasion of Ukraine continues to affect our oil prices. And as we all know, folks, with the cost of living at an all-time high, we can really feel it in our pockets. Can we afford to pay more to fill up our cars? I'll be asking the question whether or not it now is actually the time to lift that ban on fracking. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Conservative MP, Tom Tugendhat, will join me on this show this afternoon before 3 p.m. to give us the latest on the war between Russia and Ukraine. He's warned this week that the cost of living crisis here in the UK will only increase with that war. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts though. Should we actually lift that ban on fracking? Would it get your consent? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. Don't forget you can watch online too. Go to YouTube, search for GB News. And whilst you're there, click on that red subscribe button as well. Cheers very much. Well, hey, what a week it has been. What a week. There's nothing like the threat, right, of nuclear holocaust to remind us all of how indulgent arguing about gender pronouns and net zero really is, folks. But if any part of you, any part at all, was frantically trying to work out how it is that Russia can stroll over a sovereign nation's border and bomb it, let me spell it out for you very simply. It's because President Putin has been preparing for this moment, building the fourth largest currency reserves in the world, despite only being the 11th largest economy in the world. Putin has been busy getting his country invasion ready and is wearing sanction-proof body armour. The West, you see, is waxing lyrical about punitive sanctions on this Russian billionaire and that Russian business. This is a nonsense, right? This is child's play. The reason Russia has been able to make sanctions ineffectual is down to the billions that every single day are spent by Europeans on Russian oil and gas. 
Putin's war machine has grown fat on a diet of European taxpayer money, with economies like Germany and Italy terrified of the prospect of being weaned from the Russian teat. It's about time Western countries were using all available means to alleviate a continent's dependence and the cost burden to its taxpayers. We know that decorating the English countryside in solar panels and windmills isn't going to power Europe. We know we need to look again at things like shale gas extraction and resuscitating North Sea oil uh, exploration. But as my guest today, Tom Tugendhat MP, has warned, the UK's cost of living crisis will be driven by war, with gas, petrol and food prices surging. Never mind the Nord Stream 2 pipeline binding Germany to Russia. Successive governments across Europe have actually made many mistakes in a mad dash to reduce carbon emissions. A push for net zero, folks, has had us driving around in diesel cars that they now say have created unsafe, toxic plumes in cities. It had us burning, and this isn't a joke, by the way, it had us burning so-called renewable wood pellets that emit more carbon than the coal that we rushed to replace. But in the here and now, I think we ought to take and recognise how serious this is. Because I promise you, right, not one part of me regrets my vote for Brexit as Germany and Italy kowtow to Russia, a little like Oliver Twist with his begging bowl, saying, please, sir, can I have some more? On bended knee, frankly. I can't believe when something is this serious. They say, oh, well, if only we had more wind turbines, we'd be able to tackle Russian aggression. I mean, what planet are you living on? This is cartoon. Governments that weren't in such a rush to capitulate to a middle-class activist base wouldn't implement policies that boost Putin's coffers and increase prices here at home. They would have invested a long time ago in nuclear plants, an energy source able to produce large amounts of energy and high-skill, high-wage jobs at home. Instead, folks, we have ginormous wind turbines and solar panel after solar panel, which is helpful to Chinese companies, but not much help for the great British consumer. We could have been exploring alternatives now as we wait for these new nuclear plants to come online. As the Prime Minister himself said in his 2012 Telegraph column, it, fracking, is glorious news for humanity. It doesn't need the subsidy of wind power. I don't know whether it'll work in Britain, but we should get fracking right away. Fracking in this country, the limited amounts we could exploit before it was banned, was proven to produce high quality natural gas that could quickly meet the UK's demand with smaller areas used than the acre after acre required for wind turbines and solar farms. America did it, folks, and created high-quality gas, highly paid jobs and happy consumers at home. We need to look at what we know works, not focus on some fantasy, unobtainable vision of what we'd like to be. Our consumers are crying out for help, and the people of Ukraine are as well. In addressing our catastrophic energy policy now, we can alleviate both our reliance upon Russia and our dogmatic fixation on expensive unreliables. So how eh, Boris, the time to get real has years since passed. So to kick us off on fracking this afternoon, we've been to Coventry to see if people there would support lifting the ban on fracking if it meant that they had lower energy bills. Enough about it, fracking, but I do know when it happened in Blackpool, um, they weren't very happy about it because some, some of the earth moved. I don't know. I'd obviously have to find out more, but obviously we want natural fuel, but not at the expense of, of, of the habitat. So... That would be my opinion. I think it's a good idea if we can get our own energy sources or whatever, we can bring our bills down and we haven't got to rely on other countries to do it. So, yeah, if we can do it ourselves and produce it ourselves, yeah. I think fracking's a good idea because it's going to start to lower our energy. I can't see why people are complaining about it. It depends where they're going to do it, of course, in where the location, but otherwise I haven't got nothing against it. Well, I don't agree with fracking. 
because I think it spoils things, it spoils the planet, ruins it. it just People in Coventry there giving their thoughts on fracking. It's now 2.13 and Western countries have imposed sanctions on Russia in an attempt to cripple their economy and halt its military. But could it actually have a financial impact on us here in the UK too, with the availability of food and the cost of our fuel going up? Is this actually reason for us to lift the ban on fracking and try and alleviate bills and the burden on hard-pressed, frankly, taxpayers in this country. Here to discuss this, I'm joined by Sam Hall, who's the director of the Conservative Environment Network, an energy analyst and the mayor. Now, in light of the, of the war in Ukraine, this has changed everything for me personally. How does this affect the UK? How does it mean that our petrol prices, fuel and energy will actually go up, Andy? Well, in the short term, we should expect to see further rises. We're already experiencing some of the highest levels of oil and gas prices since about 2014, and there's further to go. Uh, fundamentally, what happens in these markets is that uncertainty creates upward pressure, and that pressure will continue until the situation in the Ukraine is stabilized in any direction, if it does. So at the moment, the traders are setting the market prices, and we should expect to pay a little bit more until that changes. So, Andy, are you saying then, you know, Great Britain can actually be looking at what it can do domestically and actually fracking would be one of the options that we should explore? So this is an argument that's not just dependent on what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment, but it is relevant. And what we're looking at there is that we are going to be dependent on oil and gas for at least the next 20 to 30 years, if not the next 30 to 50, regardless of what we do with the transition to a low carbon economy. Under those circumstances, the choice is really very simple. Either we're importing gas, and in this case, funding Russian tanks, or we're drilling it and taxing it here, in which case we can actually use that money for better purposes, which includes funding the low carbon transition. So it's a no brainer. We should be fracking now, drilling now, in order to avoid worse things happening later. So, Sam, would you not think that that's very reasonable? You know, what Andy's saying there is that we frack for the future. We frack to get to the kind of future that you and I actually want to ultimately see in the end. Thanks, Darren, and thanks for having me on your show today. I mean, I definitely think that energy security has um, become a much greater priority in light of the uh, situation in Ukraine. Um, and I think, you know, understandable that we're focused now very much on how we can disarm Vladimir Putin of what is being a very significant weapon of his, which is his ability to export gas and make lots of tax revenue from that. However, I'm sceptical still that fracking uh, would generate sufficient quantities of gas to be able to significantly improve our situation with regards to energy security. Yes, there are big reserves of shale gas within the UK. However, only a small fraction of that is actually extractable. We know from previous attempts at fracking that it causes earth tremors which frequently calls those fracking operations to stop, and it comes up against significant local opposition. So I just don't think it's practical to put all of our hopes and expectations in fracking as a route out of this. Instead, I think a more practical approach would be to insulate people's homes so that we just use less gas. Um, and I think there have been various schemes tried over the years. I think we need a serious long-term commitment to install insulation in people's walls and roofs, and then we would reduce our gas and improve our energy security and take away this weapon from Vladimir Putin that he has at the moment. Andy, address that point then, because it, it, Sam is right there that it, it, it does seem as if it, it would come up with fierce democratic opposition where people say, I do not want one of these sites that causes earth tremors next to me. So how do you get beyond that point? You know, how do we actually obtain the land of milk and honey if we, if we can't actually get the, those drills into the ground because of opposition to them? Well, it's not either or. And let's just take those issues uh, in turn. It's basically gas now and green later. So what do we do about local opposition and the prior experience? Well, the government made a number of mistakes in the last decade on fracking. It allowed green activists like Friends of the Earth and Frack Free to set the agenda and set safety criteria that were ludicrous. So most industrial activity that happens below the Earth's surface creates tremors of some kind, somewhere between two to four on the Richter scale. Only at the upper end of that are there safety concerns. Below that, you don't feel it. And instead of that, the government decided that 0 0.5 on the Richter scale, which is basically somebody jumping next to you or dropping a kettle, 
would be something that should stop operations, whereas anything above two would be a reason to pause them significantly until they could work out why. So they effectively so, Sam, a lot of people though watching this will off. be opening their energy bills. And look, I've heard it myself. I've heard it when, personally, anecdotally, my mother opened her energy bills and she let out an audible gasp. Now, she's not alone in that. There are people up and down the country who are genuinely saying, I'm going to have to make a choice here uh, whether or not I heat or eat. And... People in Britain shouldn't be forced to make a choice like that. Subsidising these great big windmills and solar panels isn't actually bearing the economic rewards that we were told it would. Well, I think the case for fracking potentially cutting people's energy bills is even worse than the case for improving our energy security. So we're part of a wider interconnected European gas market. There are pipelines connecting the UK to continental Europe. Um, the gas price is set at that European level. We also get imports of LNG, which also, again, reflect the market price. So any shell gas that was extracted in the UK would simply be sold at that wider European price. And so I think that its potential for uh, reducing people's bills is very small. On the other hand, we do know that um, wind and solar being the cheapest forms of new electricity generation right now uh, are able to cut people's energy bills because it means that we burn less gas for electricity. Similarly, insulation and energy efficiency, which I mentioned earlier as being good for energy security, that too would help cut people's bills right now if we installed that lagging in people's homes and meant that they uh, wasted less energy. So I think those are much better solutions in terms of dealing with people's energy bills and rather than doubling down yet again on people's uh, on gas. Andy, I'll let you come back to those points that Sam's just made, but ultimately I wonder, is it your opinion that fundamentally the net zero objective is incompatible, frankly, with any true level and up agenda? Certainly an ideological approach to net zero is totally incompatible because you're just trying to stop uh, new sources of supply and suggesting that new sources of supply don't have an impact on prices is just an anti-economic argument. If we look at those renewables, well, yes, the last round of bids for new offshore wind were pretty cheap. Brilliant. That's great news for Britain. We know, there's no guarantee that the future bids will be cheap as well, because one of the things that increases with the price of energy is the cost of renewables. They're all made from the same stuff as everything else. So at the moment, some of the big wind manufacturers are going underwater because they can't afford the cost of materials. So this is just not a win to try and shut down gas before you have affordable alternatives available. And really what Sam and I are arguing about is the speed at which you do these things. I want the alternatives to be ready, not forcing the issue by cutting off our currently cheapest and best source of secure energy. Yeah, so Sam, basically, Andy's painting a picture there that says that you're being a little bit Panglossian about this. You've been a little bit too rose-tinted glasses, maybe, in, in your vision of what Britain can look like now, as opposed to what it can look like in the future when we've got all this new fancy green tech. I don't accept that. I think I, I am accepting the fact that we're going to need gas during the transition. We're going to need it to back up the renewable energy generation. We're going to need it to continue heating our homes. And the government is continuing to extract oil and gas out of the North Sea as well. And indeed, recently approved a new set of licenses uh, in the North Sea to open up new gas fields. So I'm not saying that we turn the taps off on gas overnight. I don't think that's realistic. I think it has to be uh, a transition over a number of years. However, what I am sceptical of is the merit in starting up this whole new industry in, in terms of shale, which we spent a decade basically uh, trying to get off the ground in the 2010s, uh, came up against local opposition, didn't really have any significant effect, wasted millions of taxpayers' money. And I just think it's a false solution being pushed now. And actually, we are fortunate that the energy economics of clean energy have got much better. And now seems the time to be doubling down and accelerating on those rather than looking to these technologies of the past. So Andy, in a word, should we lift the ban? Of course we should. Let's drill for victory, Darren. Sam, should we lift the ban? Uh, no, I don't think it would be worthwhile. Brilliant, folks. Thank you very much for your time. That was Sam Hall from the Conservative Environment Network and the energy analyst Andy Mayer. Thank you very much for joining me on Real Britain this afternoon. Now, look, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I'll be joined by the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee shortly to discuss all things Ukraine. But first, let's have a little look at that weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, but with rain and strong winds moving into the northwest. Let us take a look at the details. A dry evening and night for Plymouth and southwest England with plenty of clear spells. Staying on the windy side, especially over high ground and along northern and western coasts. 
For London and South East England, it will also be a breezy, dry and clear evening with little in the way of cloud in the sky. It's a similar story for Cardiff and South Wales, although a windier evening here than further east, especially over hills and coasts. Temperatures this evening will be around 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. A dry evening with clear skies for Birmingham and the West Midlands. Again, it will be on the breezy side, but overall it will remain settled with temperatures of 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. More of the same across northeastern England with dry and clear conditions dominating, some breezy or windy conditions at times and evening temperatures in the range of 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. A largely dry evening for southern Scotland, although with broken or overcast cloud persisting for most, the best of any clear spells across northern and eastern areas, temperatures of 6 to 8 Celsius. Across the Irish Sea, it'll be a cloudy evening for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland will keep the cloud and southerly winds allowing for mild conditions to persist overnight. Tomorrow staying dry across most of the UK, but with rain and strong winds edging into the northwest and far west overnight. And that's how the weather's shaping up. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> uh, opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, Russian assaults on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, have been met with pretty fierce resistance. The Ukrainian military says it fought off several attacks. President Volodymyr Zelensky said the occupiers wanted to block the centre of our state. We broke their plan. The fighting continues near several other Ukrainian cities. Tom Tugendhat is the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and joins me down the line. Tom, can I start off by asking you, do you actually think the UK sanctions go anywhere near far enough to affect Russia? Are we leading the world on this? Well, they didn't on Monday. They look like they might now. I think we're making a change. I think the Prime Minister's pressure on the SWIFT system is important. I think the difference that we're making is real. Yes, there's 
further sanctions I'd like to see. There's a, there's a few extra pushes I'd like to make. We still know that there are Russian oligarchs who have assets here in the UK. I'd like to see them frozen. And those who benefit from that money, whether they're families or hangers-on or whatever it is, uh, we look at the source of that wealth and make sure that it is returned to the people it actually belongs to, the Russian people it was stolen from. Some Ukrainians are arguing that actually we, as the West, especially Britain and the US, as far as our military might's concerned, have failed them as we promised to protect them and, you know, we just haven't done that, say, put troops on, at the border, for example. Is this true? Is it your view that actually Britain hasn't done enough, has failed actually in its duty? Well, I was in Ukraine about three weeks ago and I met with many people, but amongst them was the National Security Advisor to the President. When I asked him who is his best ally, he said, I'll give you that in three words, the UK, the UK, the UK. Now, it's quite telling that the UK has been absolutely side by side with the Ukrainian armed forces, not just for a few months, but many years. Operation Orbital, as it's known, has been training the Ukrainian armed forces and everything from various different military tactics to medical, um, you know, medical uh, procedures and things like that. We've been absolutely with the Ukrainians. If others had joined us, I think we might be in a slightly different position. So I think what we need to be focused on is not just what's been going on uh, in these last few weeks, but what's been going on over many, many years. Now, look, I was very pleased to see today the announcement that the Dutch government is giving the Ukrainian people Stinger missiles. Now, that, again, is an important, uh, an important contribution. So I think there are many people who are making a difference. And I'm very glad that we're one of them. What do you say to those mothers of, of boys who are serving in our armed forces who are thinking, hang on a minute, you know, I'm listening to Tom talk about these very laudable things and what Britain can do around the world, but I'm actually really worried about my, you know, boy or girl's safety. Well, you're quite right to be. And, you know, as somebody who's actually worn the Queen's uniform and fought in Iraq and Afghanistan for many years, I can tell you, I'd never ask anybody to do something I haven't already done myself. Uh, so I'm this isn't some remote idea. I know what it's like to be frightened before you get on the Hercules into battle. I know what it's like to be on the start line. It is your mouth dries and it's not easy. But what we're doing when we stand with our NATO allies in Estonia and Poland and many other countries is we're actually on the front, front line of our own freedom. We have a choice here in these islands, you know. We have a pretty simple choice. Do you want the border to start literally at Dover? and just hope that the enemy doesn't come close? Or do you want to have strategic depth? An amazing luxury, very few countries can manage. Have your border two, 3,000 miles away. Well, that's what we've got with NATO. We've managed to push our own border to the eastern edge of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, to the eastern edge of Hungary and Romania. That gives us strategic depth and it makes the UK much, much safer. But are you saying we actually need more troops there now? Because, you know, Kiev, it's not looking great, is it? It's, it's looking like the Russians, it's, a ma it's only a matter of time really now, isn't it, until it falls? Well, you say that. I, I, I certainly thought that a few days ago. I'm beginning to wonder whether I was right. The Ukrainian uh, population, some civil defence, some regular army, some border force, have pinned down one of the world's largest armies for now three days. It's an extraordinary achievement. Now, whatever happens next, and I don't know what's going to happen next, the, very, the very fact that they've held on is remarkable. And the courage of President Zelensky is a stark contrast to that coward in the Kremlin who won't even shake hands with somebody who hasn't had a DNA test to check whether or not they've got a sniffle. It's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I have been really struck by the resilience of the people in Ukraine, to be honest with you. The sight of, you know, people praying as you hear the sirens go off in the background. It's actually incredibly moving, Tom, to be frank with you. You know, this country that is so unapologetic about its desire to be part of the, not just the international community, but actually part of Western values, democratic values. And this Russian dictator is trying to ride roughshod over them. I think it's a beautiful sight, frankly. Well, I agree with you, Darren. You know, we talk about liberty here. We talk about sovereignty here. Well, if your sovereignty doesn't include the right to choose your allies, if it doesn't include your right to not be occupied by a foreign army, your right to defend yourself uh, and your home, your hospital, your school against foreign invasion, sovereignty is... Now, I stand very firmly with the Ukrainian people because what they're demonstrating is a remarkable courage against a brutal dictatorship. But let's not forget... The people they're standing against are Putin and his gang. 
Zelensky gave yeah, an well, incredible speech, incredible speech yesterday, in which he highlighted those Russians who have spoken out against President Putin, those poets and those, those, those writers who have been remarkably brave. And so we've got to remember that many, many Russians are very against President Putin as well. Mm. Yeah, Tom, just quickly there, in The Spectator today, Brendan O'Neill writes that there's a, a rise of Russophobia, and he's linked you to it with anti-Russian rhetoric on your remarks as about actually, you know, we've got in this country, could just say to Russians here, living here, actually, sorry, your time's up, back home you go. Well, I'm afraid I think Brendan's just wrong on this. Absolutely standard when a country goes to war uh, in an act of unprovoked aggression, that any uh, other country that is allied to the, sorry, forgive me, I'm being disturbed by children, but any other uh, country that is uh, that is connected to that country that's been attacked, normally expels the citizens of. Uh, you know, the aggressive country and freezes their assets. That's absolutely standard. So if uh, if the UK it, it could do it. Now, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think the right thing to do is to freeze the assets of Putin's oligarchs, to expel those who are connected to the regime, and make sure people like uh, Lavrov, the foreign minister, are not able to come and visit their mistress in London. I think so that's just to the be clear, then, you're not saying, you know, every Russian citizen who might well be, as you say, opposed to Putin, right, living in this country who's been here maybe since the Cold War, you weren't trying to suggest for a second that, you know, every single Russian indiscriminately must leave the country. So let me tell you just quickly, two of my friends who I am working with on this very project and work very closely with, I'm working with my friend Gary Kasparov, who, as you know, is a Russian citizen, chess grandmaster, but is regularly in the UK. Frankly, there is no bigger opponent of uh, President Putin. Nobody has been clearer in calling out the, the evil that this regime has done. And the second person is Gary Kodakovsky, who has, as well, risked his life to warn us about Putin. So let's be quite clear. We are talking about the people who surround themselves with the trappings of power that Putin is able to give them. Those are the Russians that we must be clear about, and sadly, not just Russians. Darren, well, you and I both know that there are some people, like a former chancellor in Germany and a former prime minister in France, who played that game too. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Tom Tugendhat there, proven that you can actually do two things, live telly and children. So there we are, we've proven that. Thank you very much for spending your Saturday afternoon with me on Real Britain. You're with GB News on TV and DEB Radio. We'll continue to discuss the battle for Kiev with the former British Army head, Colonel Richard Kemp. Good afternoon. It's 2.35. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom. The mayor of Kiev has imposed a curfew in Ukraine's capital from Saturday evening until Monday morning for the safety of its people. The Ukrainian president has urged Russia to end this war as he announced that 100,000 Russian soldiers have invaded the country. Citizens are being warned to seek shelter as gunfire and explosions have been heard throughout Kiev and fighting has broken out on the streets. The Home Secretary has cancelled the visas of the Belarusian men's basketball team who were due to play in Newcastle tomorrow night. Priti Patel has tweeted that the UK will not welcome the national sports teams of those countries who are complicit in Putin's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine. NATO leaders, including the UK and US, have agreed to give more weapons, medical supplies and military aid to Ukraine. NATO are also deploying significantly more troops to Eastern Europe to bolster its defences. US President Joe Biden will provide up to £450 million to fund immediate aid and military training. The UN Refugee Agency says more than 120,000 Ukrainian refugees have left the country since Russia began its invasion. The UN Aid Agency is also warning that fuel, cash and medical supplies are running low in parts of the country, which could drive up to 5 million people to flee abroad. 
In other news now, British Airways passengers have criticised absolute chaos at Heathrow Airport after a technology outage. Travellers complained of a lack of communication after all short-haul flights were cancelled up until midday today. The issue also caused flight delays and baggage pile-ups. BA's tweeted that it's fixed the problem, claiming it was down to a hardware issue and not a cyber attack. This is GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. Back to Darren Grimes' Real Britain in just a moment. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. So more now on that battle for Kiev. Colonel Richard Kemp joins me on the show now. Richard, I don't know if you heard that my last guest there, Tom Tugan, had the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, but he was painting a picture actually of what we can actually be proud of as far as the response has been from Britain. Do you share that or would you like to see us going much further? I think Britain was one of the leaders in the support of Ukraine and we we can indeed be proud of what we did. We, we trained 22,000 Ukrainian soldiers. We provided 2,000 anti-tank missiles. We provided intelligence and aerial surveillance over Ukraine and over Russia. So, yeah, we did more than many countries did. But perhaps we could have done even more. I, I think President Zelensky asked for more lethal supply of weapons, which we didn't provide to him. Maybe we didn't have them. I don't know. Uh, but now is the time to go even further and to do our best in very difficult circumstances to deliver even more lethal weapons to Ukraine. Anything we can do, whether it's weapons, equipment, finance, anything we can do to help the Ukrainian army keep fighting. Richard, as someone who cares passionately about our, our boys out there that fighting to keep Britain safe, are you actually looking back now and feeling quite angry at the cuts that have taken place in our armed forces. And now, actually, are we seeing the, the fruits of such an endeavour? When you cut the military, of course, you cannot intervene and, and, and actually help out around the world as much as perhaps we would have been able to in the past. Yeah, and I think even last year's Defence Review, which cut the size of the British Army by around 10,000 troops, slashed our tank figures and also our armoured infantry combat vehicle uh, carriers. Um, these things were, I think, devastating to the British Army, which has already been brought low to the lowest level since probably Tudor times wow. um, by successive defence cuts. And I think now is the time to 
to, to re-examine that and, and actually spend some money and build up our forces back to a level where they can actually confront, realistically confront, in armoured warfare if necessary, uh, ru further Russian aggression. Yeah, you wrote in The Telegraph that we should actually be arming Ukraine even more than we have been. How important is it that we, we do that now? Do you, is it not a case of it being, frankly, a little too little too late? Well, it may be um, a bit late, but it's never too late, I don't think. And, and while the Ukrainian army is fighting, we should be helping them in any way that we can, any way they need. But we should also be preparing at the same time, if President Putin does take over the whole of Ukraine or a large swathe of Ukraine, we should be preparing to support uh, a resistance movement if it builds up to to oppose him and to inflict further casualties on him after this conflict is over. If that's the way it turns out, I don't know if it will. But we should certainly be ready to uh, to turn Ukraine into a quagmire for President Putin if it comes to it. Well, exactly. And I've had conversations with you in the past about Afghanistan, for example, and, and your views on that. But this is this is a whole different ball game because if President Putin occupies Ukraine, it's he's not going to stop there, Richard. Right? This is rose-tinted glasses. If you think that he's going to just say, "All right, I've got Ukraine now. I've had me fill," it's going to go much further than that, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. It depends how this war works out for him. It may be that uh, it, it, he's not as successful as he hoped to be. We'll see. Possible. Um, but assuming it does work as, as he wants it to work, which I think it might do, then, uh, yeah, he's got his eyes on the Baltic states. He doesn't see them as legitimate entities either. And he will want to send peacekeeping troops in there at some stage in the future. And that's where we must be ready to resist. We must be ready to follow our treaty obligations to NATO countries and, uh, and, and deploy very heavy forces along with our NATO allies. Can you see a scenario in which the British Army will actually be out there in Ukraine on the ground? I don't think there's any will for that at all from either Britain or from any other NATO country. I think that's been made clear by our politicians, uh, you know, very frequently in the last weeks. So, no, I don't, I don't see that happening. I mean, obviously, one can never foretell the future and some dire catastrophe could befall Ukraine, which would necessitate uh, some kind of Western action. But I think it would have to be pretty dire to do that. Yeah. And Richard, just really quickly, what would you say to those that argue that the expansion of both the European Union and of NATO are responsible and actually it's the West's fault? Well, of course, that's uh, Russian propaganda. Putin knows very well. He often cites expansionism by NATO and the EU as the reason for his assault on Ukraine and his ambitions to reassert the former Soviet Union more widely in, in Eastern and Northern Europe. But he knows very well that neither NATO, well, that NATO is not an offensive alliance. NATO poses no threat whatsoever to him. It's a defensive alliance. He knows that very well. He also knows that really no European country has the stomach, and I would doubt whether the US under the current administration has the stomach, to, to take up arms against Russia. Even, I, I would even question whether we, whether Europe as a whole is willing to do that if he goes into a NATO state. But he knows that very well, and that's why he um, invaded. He knew that he would face no significant opposition from the West. And, of course, one of the main, uh, I think one of the main prompters for him to go into Ukraine right now was the humiliation of NATO and the US in Afghanistan, self-imposed humiliation, which showed weakness. And when Putin smells weakness, he goes for it, and as, he, as he's doing right now. Yeah, and of course, you know, China's watching. There are so many other things happening around the world. It's very serious times, and I think we've got to get real on this, and Europe's going to have to start spending its 2% on GDP of GDP on defence, at least. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure. It's now 2.46, and something closer to home is coming up. Transport for London has announced changes to its congestion charge scheme this week. It means reduced charge in hours. Drivers now only need to pay the £15 levy if they travel into central London within an 11-hour window from 7am to 6pm on weekdays. Howard Cox joins me now. He's the founder of the Fair Fuel UK campaign, a very important campaign. Howard, what actually are these changes? How do they affect us? 
<laughs> Very much so. And hello, Darren. Nice to be on your show again. Um, well, let's face it, this London ego-driven, economically illiterate uh, mayor is saying that we can now drive without being uh, charged in, in London after six o'clock every evening until midday on at the weekends as well, in the mornings. But the point is, he's not reducing it back to what it was, which is £11.50. He's still keeping it at £15. And he's already destroyed half of the businesses in, in London, the theatre, the cinema, the restaurants. I know so many people, uh, Fairfield UK supporters, and we've got 1.7 million of them, they've contacted me and said they don't bother going to London now because of ultra-low emission zones, low traffic net networks, cycle lanes, and now the congestion charge, even though it's going to be freer in the evening, it won't encourage more people because guess what? He's putting public transport up fares by 5%. He's a complete, complete, as I say, economically illiterate mayor. Well, hang on, though. They, the mayor would say, he would turn around and say, well, actually, Howard, I need to do this because the bank, uh, not the Bank of England, the Transport for London <laughs> is facing significant debts, actually, and we need to clear those debts. Do you not agree, think that's reasonable? It's reasonable, the fact that you've got to clear your debts, but it's not reasonable the fact that he actually is responsible for creating them in the first place. <laughs> the guy cannot manage London's funding whatsoever. And people are fed up about he says he's our capital. It's one of the best cities in the world. And he has been strangling businesses almost to extinction. You just talk to any cab driver at the moment in time. So many have contacted me and said they're giving up. They can't be bothered. They're being the, the congestion charge is not preventing congestion. What's preventing congestion? There is other uh, road transport policies and all based on behind a green agenda and, and an idealism which no one supports. Yeah, Howard, you know what gets me is that this actually, uh, the impact of, of much of these levies and, and green things, as you, as you rightly suggest, is, I think are disproportionately impacting those who use their cars for work, right? Whether you be driving a van around or anything, a taxi, as you say, these other things are really punitive for drivers. Is this just a push to basically say, I want you to change your lifestyle, and that includes your form of employment. Exactly, of course they are, and it's unconsulted, Darren. No one's asked us how the best way to do it. The major stakeholder in this country, not just in London, but in rural roads, are 37 million UK drivers, and they haven't been asked whatsoever. Most of the decisions have been made by uh, people wearing Lycra, uh, the, these uh, transport czars or, whatever, or active transport czars they have in various parts of the, the cities across the country. And uh, I'm afraid it's not right that what he's doing. Everyone recognises that, and for, I have no idea why he was re-elected. We've got him for another three years now. And the point is, all he's going to do is strangle and, and cash grab as every opportunity. Well, Howard Cox, you'll be there, no doubt, to cheer it all on and fight for lower cost of living. That's Howard Cox, the founder of the Fair Fuel UK campaign, always a pleasure. It's 2.50 and time for our scrap, reform or keep section of the show. Now, on scrap, reform, keep, it's the time where we're going to be discussing what, whether or not, frankly, we should get rid of devolution. Has it been a success? Has it not? It's causing lots of problems. And I think the COVID pandemic, frankly, has exposed the devolved parliaments and assemblies where I think it's been a failure in those places. And that power should now just be retained in Westminster. But should we actually argue, can you see another side of the argument where we embrace devolution and we actually see metropolitan mayors like Ben Houchen and Andy Burnham, Andy Street as well. Henry Hill is the deputy editor of Conservative Home and he joins me now. Henry, I know your view on this. You are very passionate about uh, against devolution. What actually is your view? Should we should we scrap it? Is that is that what your position is? Well, I think the important thing is to bear in mind that devolution originally had a more precise meaning than it has now, and it referred to legislative devolution, which is where Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland were given uh, assemblies uh, or parliaments which could par you know, actively make law. That's different, very different to administrative devolution, which is where you create a, a mayoralty or a local government council or something like that, which has merely administrative power and can't make law. And the fact that in England we're now calling the latter devolution is muddying the debate. I think that localism and administrative devolution can be a great thing. You know, we absolutely don't need to have all the decisions made in Whitehall and Westminster for the entire country. We can see in areas like Tees Valley that having genuinely empowered local leadership can be a great thing. 
But I think what is important is that we have the courage after 25 years now of the legislative devolution experiment to take a cold look at what it's done to our United Kingdom, at the actual governing outcomes it's producing, which in many cases aren't very good, and not outright, outright abolish it, currently that would be politically impossible, but certainly reassess the right balance of power between those devolved legislators and the centre and revive the British state's role as sort of the ultimate guarantor for all British people of good public services and everything else. So, Henry, do you, do you agree with me then that actually all we've done is devolve power from Westminster, hand it to the Welsh Assembly, hand it to Holyrood, and now there is power centralised in both of those, right? All we've done is actually take it from what people consider to be a remote and, well, it is accountable, but a remote institution nonetheless that doesn't understand local needs. Actually, that's all we've done as far as, you know, Tony Blair's devolution agenda is concerned. Absolutely. I think one of the you know, one of the telling things about the, the devolution referendums, for example, in, in 1997 in Scotland is that Orkney and Shetland, who are about as far from Westminster as it's possible to get in the sort of metropolitan United Kingdom, uh, voted against it. And the reason for that is that they thought actually Westminster is more likely to let them govern their own affairs than a centralising administration in Edinburgh. And, and so it's proven the, the Scottish government, uh, ever since especially the advent of the SNP administration in 2007, has waged a sort of war against COSLA, the Scottish Local Government Association. It's squeezed local government autonomy by freezing council tax rates and then topping up that money with central government grants where the SNP ministers, rather than local councillors, decide how that money is spent. And you can see the same sort of similar story in Wales. In, in Wales, Wales' geography means that actually it doesn't make sense to run a lot of things on a sort of north-south all Wales basis. South Wales is much better connected to places like Bristol in the southwest of England. North Wales is much better connected to areas like Merseyside. But the nationalist sort of small end nationalist ministers in Cardiff Bay um, have a strong ideological objection to that kind of messy cross border working. And so instead, what we've seen time and again is they insist on a north south Welsh solution, even when that means poorer outcomes. And, we, and you, you mentioned the pandemic. We saw this early on in the pandemic where people in North Wales, especially, had to face a four hour round trip to get to what was at that yeah, point. Yeah, I mean, the, utterly bizarre, the, Henry. It really, really, really was. But are you saying then if we go scrap, reform or indeed keep, I'm assuming that you're going to go with reform, actually, and not scrap? So no, I, I personally, I personally think that scrap and reform are ultimately the same thing. You get rid of legislative devolution, you package it with a much more aggressive and, ex and generous local devolution, or we're going to call it that, local government offer to areas in Wales and Scotland so they can genuinely run their own affairs without having an ultra-centralising administration in Cardiff or Edinburgh. I think I agree with you. That's Henry Hill there, always sound, Deputy Editor of Conservative Home. Thank you very much. Now, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. I'll be back tomorrow at 2pm. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for most, but with rain and strong winds moving into the northwest. Let us take a look at the details. A dry evening and night for Plymouth and southwest England with plenty of clear spells. Staying on the windy side, especially over high ground and along northern and western coasts. For London and southeast England, it will also be a breezy, dry and clear evening with little in the way of cloud in the sky. It's a similar story for Cardiff and South Wales, although a windier evening here than further east, especially over hills and coasts. Temperatures this evening will be around 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. A dry evening with clear skies for Birmingham and the West Midlands. Again, it will be on the breezy side, but overall it will remain settled with temperatures of 5 to 7 degrees Celsius. More of the same across northeastern England with dry and clear conditions dominating, some breezy or windy conditions at times and evening temperatures in the range of 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. A largely dry evening for southern Scotland, although with broken or overcast cloud persisting for most, the best of any clear spells across northern and eastern areas, temperatures of 6 to 8 Celsius. Across the Irish Sea, it will be a cloudy evening for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland will keep the cloud and southerly winds allowing for mild conditions to persist overnight. Tomorrow staying dry across most of the UK, but with rain and strong winds edging into the northwest and far west overnight. And that's how the weather's shaping up.
Join me, Anaya Falar and Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here from big ideas to questions shaping the public conversation. We tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here at GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good afternoon, it's three o'clock. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB newsroom. A US defense official says America has seen more than 250 Russian missile launches on Ukrainian targets. The mayor of Kiev has imposed a curfew in the capital from Saturday evening until Monday morning for the safety of its people. The Ukrainian president says the country is still controlling Kiev, but urged the UN 